Welcome class to this week's lecture, which is about summative based formative assessments. Here's our vocabulary preview. And so by the end of this presentation, you should know the meaning of, of these three phrases. Remember that there is an extra credit vocabulary assignment that is due in May. Here's our agenda for today. We're going to be talking about summative based versus embedded formative assessment and types of summative-based formative assessments, instructional strategies related to summative-based formative assessments, and learning progressions. So first of all, what is a summative-based formative assessment? Well, the column on the right shows you what we talked about last week, embedded formative assessments. These are assessments that generally are uh, informal and on the fly. So what does that mean? Uh, you're questioning students, you're discussing with students, you're observing students in order to figure out what they do and don't know. It's often informal or ungraded. Embedded formative assessment generates results immediately. You ask a student a question, they answer you, you know what they know. And it frequently occurs during instruction. So some examples, as we talked about last week, are in, embedded or of embedded are questioning during a lesson, classroom discussion, pair and share, classroom observation, and many more. Summative-based formative assessment, on the other hand, is summative-based assessment that occurs after instruction, but you're using it to formatively assess learning going forward. So what did I mean by that? Let's look at some characteristics. Well, first of all, it's usually planned. So an example would be you plan a homework assignment. You've taught the students one lesson, let's say in math, and you plan to, you've planned to give them homework and you give them homework, that's summative because you might um, record a grade against that particular lesson, but it really is formative because you're not just going to teach that lesson, you're, you're teaching several lessons to cover a major unit, for example. So you're using it formatively going forward even though it might be summative for the one lesson that you taught, and it's planned. It's often formal or graded, so for example, quizzes, tests, homework, and it only generates results after some time has passed since instruction. So you teach the lesson, and you give the homework, and they go home and do the homework, and they bring it back, and you grade it. So it might be a day or two before you see whether they understand what you taught. It can occur before or following instruction. So, for example, there was a, uh, on the which is it assignment, there was a, an item about previewing students' standardized test scores before you teach them for the year. So that's a summative assessment, standardized test scores, and you're previewing it before you teach the students. So that's occurring before instruction. Or it can be like the homework or quiz that you give following instruction. But the difference between straight summative, where you don't look at it going forward, and summative-based formative, is they're both summative. They both occur after instruction. But you're using the summative-based formative to plan going forward. Examples might include using a quiz to plan next steps in instruction, using homework to see what needs to be retaught, and again, looking at previous year's scores to decide who needs support. So some types of formative assessments include pre-assessments, and this occurs before instruction. Pre-assessments are very helpful to clarify learning progression, where the student is in, uh, in their, we're going to learn a term, ladder of learning. Um, it helps to determine the appropriate level of challenge. So, if you give a pre-assessment, for example, on a spelling test, and the students, um, <clears throat> some students know all the words, then you can increase the level of challenge on those students' words. It can also help you understand learning tar or help the students understand learning targets and learning progressions. So you can post learning targets around your room, and you can say, "Okay, let's. I'm going to give you this pre-assessment." on these learning targets. Many different types of pre-assessments, so structured exercises. 
And by the way, pre-test and, and pre-assessment should always be ungraded from the standpoint of not recording a grade uh, for the student's report card because you haven't taught them yet. You can grade it, um, but just tell them that it's not going to count towards their report card grade. So uh, structured exercises, uh, so games, for example, are very good pre-assessments. They're non-threatening, and they might give you a, a, a chance to see what students do or don't know about a topic. And pre-test, uh, as I said, ungraded. And then you always follow it up with a post-test after instruction. These should be short things, by the way. Many curriculum companies, when they publish test textbooks, publish the tests that go along with the content, and they'll give you two versions. And so, for example, I used to use one version as a pre-test, and then I used to use another version as the post-test. So that was pre-assessments, but there are some post-instruction, so assessments occurring after you teach, post-instruction, summative-based formative assessments. Homework, we've already talked a little bit about. It provides additional practice, extends student learning, and helps you check on student learning. But there always is this idea with homework that you don't know if the student is actually doing it. So they could be getting help from mom or dad or brother or sister or even uh, other family or friends. Seat work, you do know the student is doing. So that's a truer method of understanding what they know. And seat work also allows you to engage and interact with students without any fear of outside assistance. So seat work in the classroom. Quizzes and tests are often used in the classroom. And they may be graded, but they also may be used formatively to check on students' knowledge and skills. So let's say you're teaching a unit on uh, social studies, and you've got four weeks in the unit, and you give a quiz at the end of each week to see how learning is progressing. You might look at the class scores on that quiz and say, oh, they didn't really get this concept. I need to back up a little bit and reteach that next week. It's helpful to review these in class so that students can really understand what they got wrong and why and cover uh, what I used to do is keep keep kind of a mental list of the most common mistakes on the test so I can make a point to, to show them um, how to do it differently or to think about it differently. It's helpful when you do quizzes and tests to give individual feedback, particularly on what we call constructed test items, not the multiple choice, obviously, they're not, you're not going to give feedback on that. You're just going to circle the right answer. But on essay items and short answers, things like that. Quizzes and tests are best used with shorter content. It's hard to give, particularly younger students, uh, a long test on a long unit. So if you're giving you know, several quizzes, if you're teaching something over four weeks, Best to break that up into a week or two before you assess them. Longer time and intervals between the end of teaching and grading feedback makes it less useful too. So if you grade something and you get it back to them two or three weeks later, it's not really helping them uh, see what they did wrong. They've pretty much forgotten some of that and so it's not as useful. Try to grade and get back quickly. So this week you're going to go out and look on the internet for a couple of digital tools. What do I mean by that? These are tools that are available online uh, to help te classroom teachers assess their students. Most of them are formative assessments. They're very common in classrooms and they frequently will have the, um, will be set up so that you ask the class a question and students will use some something, some device or some computer to respond to that question. And then the computer or the device will tabulate the responses and project up onto the screen. You can get bar charts about how many people thought answer A was right, how many people thought answer B was right. Many systems will provide feedback, and these are great formative assessment tools. You can do this without technology. So when I teach this, a class in person, I'll often give out whiteboards and students will hold up answers on whiteboards. And that is a, 
effective, but we find that with younger students, particularly, they find the technology just as very engaging. So the assignment this week is to Google formative assessments apps, and uh, there's also a website that you can look at here. So if you want, you can pause the video and, and, uh, and, and go there, and this will give you some ideas. The link for this assignment is in this week's module. So what does the term common assessment mean? Well, this is when teachers across um, grade levels, departments, or districts get together and decide and plan their units and decide to use the same assessments across, um, across the teachers' departments and districts. And so let's say you have three schools. Uh, common assessments might mean all fourth grade teachers are going to use the same assessments. And so that's good in a way because it allows you to compare students' results across different schools to see what might be going on. Um, if teachers are designing their own common assessments, there still has to be a concern about validity and reliability. So you still want it to have a good assessment. You still want it to measure what it should measure and measure the same way each time. Sometimes teachers um, will select from pre-written items. So you might have a textbook manufacturer, as I said, that gives test items. And the common assessments might say, okay, we're going to use this, this item and this item and this item and this item. And that allows them to compare across grade levels or across districts or across departments, depending on who's using the common assessment. And it may actually improve the technical quality. Interim assessments are sometimes called benchmark tests. And so the idea here is that you're going to test your students regularly. Often it's done once every grading period during the school year to monitor progress towards achieving end of year state standards. So you might give a benchmark test in the first grading unit in the first grading period, another one in the second, another one in the third, and in the fourth there might be the standardized test. They're somewhat formative because you can look at the test as you go along and see how students are doing, uh, but they don't really work effectively because little feedback is provided with the benchmark tests. However, they do provide immediate results and the reports are usually broken out by student and item. So if you hear benchmark tests, you should think of interim assessments. Then there are the year-end large-scale assessments. Uh, for example, the Smarter Balanced Assessment Consortium and the Partnership for Assessment of Readiness for College and Career, or PARC. This one focuses on the Common Core State Standard and the 21st Century Skills. So just know that your district may require assessments from either of these two organizations. The claim is from these companies that they may be used formatively. They're primarily summative, uh, but they are difficult to use formatively in general uh, because they're, they're just too broad and they cover too much material. Um, interim tests may be more useful formatively. So last week we talked in a depth about feedback and we, uh, we talked about how to structure feedback. And just another note on feedback, it's important when you're planning uh, a unit or a lesson to think about what um, student misconceptions or errors might be. And then you can provide the feedback kind of on the fly to them. So for example, when I taught science and I taught earth and space science, one of the common misconceptions uh, that students had about um, the, uh, the earth's rotation or revolution around the sun was that it wasn't, um, it wasn't elliptical. They thought it was a round circle or they thought it was went in a figure eight all kinds of weird things they thought. And so I kind of had that in my head as I taught it each year. 
to address that misconception and to provide feedback. So anticipating feedback is about understanding the learning target, knowing the um, probable student errors, and then thinking of some feedback in advance that you can give those students. Of course, all formative assessment is useful for making instructional adjustments. So changing what you're doing in some way. Formative assessment is not about just collecting a score and putting it in a folder, <coughs> excuse me, or on the computer. It's about making changes in your classroom. So what are some of those instructional adjustments you could do? Well, you could slow your part teaching down if you see that students aren't getting things, or you could speed it up if you feel like um, it's dragging and they're with you. You could assign further reading. You could have someone individually tutored. You could break the class up into small groups to find, if you find that more effective. You could model things that they're confused with. So if they're confused about how to um, take apart a motor, for example, if you're doing that for some reason, you could model that. You could do whole class oral questioning. You could re-explain things, provide additional worksheets, peer tutoring, that sometimes works well having older students or advanced students, tutor, ones that are uh, having difficulty. I will just caution you about using advanced students too frequently um, because they're not teachers and we want them to progress in their learning and not just all day serve as tutors. You could do online exploration. You could do concept mapping and you could have, give them a new digital tool to increase engagement. So. These are just a few of the instructional adjustments you could make based on the results of your formative assessment, if they are understanding or if they're not understanding. So the chapter covered a few other instructional concepts related to assessment. Mastery learning, mastery learning is something that you, you've heard of before. And this is the idea that we want to encourage mastery learning are those students who measure their competence against progress towards a standard instead of some external goal. So for example, they can say to themselves, I'm getting better at multiplying instead of I'm no good at math because I didn't get an A and, and she got an A. So we use assessment data to provide good student feedback regarding progress towards goals. And we talked a little bit about that in a previous session. Differentiated instruction is altering instruction to meet the learner's needs. And this usually takes into account learning styles, readiness, and ability. And we use assessment data here, particularly pretests and formative assessment, to diagnose students' learning needs. So maybe I give a pretest and I find out that three of my students are very advanced in the concept and three have no idea what I'm talking about. And many people are in the middle. I could, as I grow in my teaching ability, divide up the class into three groups, the, the middle class, the group, the advanced group, and the, and the group that's developing that needs more support. And I could structure the lesson just a little bit differently for each of those groups. Response to intervention, or RTI, is a multi-tiered system of support that uses assessment data to place students at various points in whole group settings, in small group settings, or more individualized settings. What are learning progressions? Learning progressions consist of a sequence of steps in learning that describe progressively more sophisticated understanding. And they provide a roadmap over an extended period of time for knowing what information needs to be gathered about student understanding and corresponding instructional adjustments that are needed. So I like to think of it as a ladder. Um, students aren't expected to go from the bottom rung of the ladder to the top of the ladder. Each rung on the ladder represents a more advanced understanding of what you're doing. And learning progressions help you diagnose where students are on that learning ladder and help them move to the next step. Standards are kind of the end point, the top of the ladder, where you want them to get to. But along the way, there are these steps and learning progressions 
cover those steps. Most standards and matching curricula that span grade levels contain learning progressions. And if you want to see a nice example of this, look on page 164 of your textbook. And there's a learning progression given. I think it's, if I remember right, it's for history that shows the progression of students across grade levels. Let's do a few questions to check some of your comprehension of this activity, of this lecture. Question one, which of the following are characteristics of an interim test? Choose all that apply. So there may be more than one correct answer. Are they given at the end of the school year? Do they typically contain less than 10 items? Are they intended to be used to assess student progress towards achieving outcome standards? Are they administered a few times a year? Do they show what a teacher may need to emphasize in instruction for selected students? Well, if we look at these choices, we know that interim tests are given throughout the year, so we can eliminate A. We never heard anything about containing less than 10 items, so we can eliminate B. But C, D, and E might be reasonable. The answer is, in fact, C, D, and E. They can assess student progress. They are administered a few times a year, and they show you, the teacher, what you need to emphasize in instruction. Let's try another question. Which of the following are, are these effective or ineffective, um, the, are these ineffective or effective instructional strategies for students who are struggling? Mr. Nail decided to give a struggling student a new app to focus on mastering the third stage of a geometric learning progression. I would say that's effective because the new app as we've talked about digital tools, is a way to raise student engagement. Letter B, Ms. Hernandez instructed three of her students who did not understand noun-verb agreement to review both appropriate and inappropriate example sentences and identify with why each was correct or incorrect. Is that effective or ineffective? I would say that's effective because it's probably a different way of going about it than they were taught before. So what we don't want to do is we don't we don't want to we don't want to use the same approach but just do it again. It's like trying to talk to someone who's hard of hearing um, in the same in the, in saying the same words in the same um, uh, volume. If if it didn't work once, it's not going to work again. So I would say that it's different and it's effective. Question three, are the following effective or ineffective? A, Mr. Cotter decided to form six small groups of students and give each group a challenging problem that matched their current level of understanding. Is that effective or ineffective? I would say that's effective because matching their current level of understanding, that's the key phrase here. It's a little bit of a challenge, but it matches where they are on the learning progression. Now, if it had just said wildly challenges and not, you know, matches, then it might be ineffective because it might be too difficult. Letter B, Mr. Zhu saw that some of his students did not fully comprehend macroeconomic theory and indicated that they needed to study harder. Is that effective or ineffective? It's probably ineffective because, again, what does that mean, study harder? How will he ensure that the students do that? Maybe they don't know how to study. So maybe a better plan would be to teach them study skills and require uh, some checking about what they're doing. The big ideas in today's lecture were that summative-based formative assessment is using assessment after learning occurs to plan instructional modifications. Summative-based formative assessments include many types, such as pre-assessments, homework, quizzes, tests, digital tools, and more. Instructional strategies may be based on these assessments, 
some instructional strategies are more effective than others. And learning progressions show us where students are on the ladder of learning. I hope you've enjoyed this lecture and good luck with the rest of the module.